Good evening, everybody. It is uh, an absolute delight to welcome you in a different kind of forum, but um, the inverted commas venue is the one that many of you know. Uh, I don't mean the webinar, but I mean the Center for Anglo-German Cultural Relations. It is, in fact, um, our first uh, of the BASF uh, lectures and uh, for this academic year. And it is my particular pleasure to uh, welcome in our virtual midst, Lars Ayer, a uh, colleague from the Department of English in Newcastle, uh, formerly um, a lecturer at um, Newcastle in the philosophy department. Um, Lars Ayer is a uh, truly accomplished novelist. Um, he has uh, written five novels, um, started, interestingly enough, with a trilogy of um, um, texts that um, were, shall we say, poignant in terms of the actual narrative. Um, he is now, in fact, also teaching uh, writing. So Spurious, Dogma, Exodus were the first uh, novels that um, he made his name with as a writer. Um, but I would also like to mention um, his uh, literary manifesto published in the White Review, and um, it is called A Literary Manifesto After the End of Literature and Manifestos. That is to say, our speaker likes paradoxes, and uh, in that sense, um, he was more than... Um, perfect to write about Nietzsche. In fact, uh, Nietzsche and the Burbs is the very reason why um, we invited him. And um, this novel published 2019 followed um, Wittgenstein Jr. That is to say, um, reputed names crop up in the titles of uh, his novels. And one wonders whether there will be a third one, uh, another name, um, perhaps Blanchot, uh, possible, because um, um, Ian is, or Lars, uh, Aya is also a, a true expert on Maurice Blanchot. That is to say, philosophy and um, fiction meet in his uh, novels, meet in his texts, and um, I think in so many ways they try also to be a manifestation of what it means to uh, bring um, philosophy, philosophical thought, um, in contact with, shall we say, less philosophically minded uh, people, um, common readers, to use Virginia Woolf's famous phrase. Um, but of course, once you have read a novel by Lars Eyer, um, you certainly will not remain a common reader. You will be enlightened in a particular fashion. So we are thrilled to have you with us, and uh, we look forward to your lecture. Just uh, very briefly, as far as the format is concerned, after last year's uh, lecture, we will have the opportunity to ask questions. The Q&A session um, preferably not over chat, because it's always a bit difficult to manage this, but I think it is much nicer if we hear uh, your voices. So um, in this case, enable your microphone, but more of that later. Um, with that, I'm delighted to hand over to you, uh, Lars, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me today. It's a great honor to speak, to speak to you. And you'll excuse me if I read from a, um, a script here. I'm always very nervous giving presentations, so this, this reassures me. I'm not going to extemporize. I'm going to read from a, I'm going to read from a, from a, from a piece of paper here. So Nietzsche and the Burbs is the second novel of a trilogy, each volume of which takes a historical philosopher as its central figure, dropping them into the contemporary world. In each case, these avatars of the real Wittgenstein, the real Nietzsche, and in my next novel, not Blanchot, but the real Simone Weil, diagnose an attempt to address the ills of our present. What moves me is the distance between the historical originals of my central characters and the contemporary UK. The anachronism of my novels is the point. Now, why these three thinkers? In part, it's because I feel them to be distant from me. 
from my usual philosophical concerns and favorites. They also seem distant from our culture, not least because Wittgenstein and Nietzsche do not only use the word culture descriptively, but in, in an evaluative sense, culture for both thinkers could be lofty, it could lead to spiritual advancement and be the object of devotion. There's a particular focus on music in Nietzsche and the Burbs, which offers just this kind of cultural seriousness to the characters of my novel who live in the suburbs of London in the present. My characters hope to achieve a kind of cultural regeneration in a manner, in a manner analogous to the historical Nietzsche. So my aim this evening is to make sense of their ambition, using music as the red thread that runs through my reflections on the real Nietzsche and on the Nietzsche of my novel. A word about method. I won't be speaking tonight as a philologist. I'm very far from being a scholar of Nietzsche, though I have some experience as a lecturer in European philosophy. I know there are scholars of Nietzsche here present. You know, I'm, I'm intimidated by you, so please be gentle. Nor will I speak as a musicologist, although I have a very, you know, very deep, long-standing interest in music. The main labor in writing this novel has been to find an appropriate musicality of style, as well as to dramatize certain themes in Nietzsche's thought. I've been much more concerned with developing appropriate cadences and creating characters and dialogue and dramatic scenes than with the intricacies of Nietzsche's thought. Thinking as a novelist is different to thinking philosophically. Though there is, of course, a philosophical dimension to novel writing. Most of my work is intuitive, and in the case of this novel, musical. Writing is an art of sound. If I appreciate the opportunity to clarify on my work today, contemplating my labors from without rather than from within, I worry that this clarification might come at the expense of musicality. Nietzsche and the Burbs is a novel set in contemporary England among sixth formers, just about to take their, their A-levels. It's a comic novel about young people. And then in my imagination, at least, it's for young people. I wrote it to be brisk, comic, and readable, to carry its readers along in a tightly uh, cadenced and um, sprung dance floor prose. As the title suggests, it's saturated with the ideas of, of the historical Nietzsche, with his life, with, it, with, it, with, it, with the people who surround the real Nietzsche in obvious and unobvious ways that it assumes no background in philosophy. There's not much plot. My character Nietzsche is a fictional, you know, fictional reincarnation of a German philosopher. He's a 19 year old boy of partly German descent, privately schooled, who following his father's death and his own mental breakdown, comes to attend a local comprehensive school to complete his A-levels. Nietzsche, his mother and sister, have had to move from their grace and favor home on the grounds of a nearby private school where his father taught um, um, uh, to an ordinary suburban house on the outskirts of Wokingham, a town 30 miles or so west of London. Nietzsche, the character, is aloof, he's quiet, but he's invaded by some, some of his fellow pupils of that school, a group of friends who are bored and dissatisfied by their suburban life and schooling, to become the singer of their band. The friends are looking for a leader a role which Nietzsche is reluctant to take on. But he does give them some useful advice to seek to deepen their supposed despair, allowing it to become truly worthy of the nihilism of their suburban situation. My main characters, Art, Paula, Merv and Chandra, Chandra is the narrator, spend their time pondering life and its meaning, the significance of their own boredom and alienation as well as getting high and drunk, all the ordinary teenage stuff. My novel explores the effects of my character Nietzsche on these friends, in particular, as it revitalizes their music making, showing how it points towards a new ethos or way of living. The title of my novel, Nietzsche and the Burbs, becomes the name of their band after Nietzsche joins them. My novel is set in the suburbs, the Burbs of my title, at the edges of Wokingham, a town 30 miles west of London. This is a very prosperous area. Uh, there are high-tech business clusters there. Innumerable housing estates built from the late 60s to the present 
spread around the pretty market town centre. The last surviving woodland is carefully maintained as a leisure resource. This is a pragmatic town, a busy town, where there's money to be made and business to be done. Like so many teens in popular culture, my characters feel something's missing in these prosperous suburbs. They don't want to do what they're supposed to do, work hard, do a vacational course at uni, find a job, settle down. They don't want the career, the mortgage, the commute. They don't want to make the suburban adjustment and accept that this is the only world there can be. So why not? What exactly is wrong with life in the suburbs? My teens have a sense of being totally managed, indeed of suburban life in general being paranoically controlled. Nothing they feel is allowed to happen. There's no spontaneousness or otherness. Pseudo event follows pseudo event. The future feels totally programmed, prescribed, modeled. The families of these teens live, as the, uh, live through abstractions. They live through representations that cover up a general evacuation of meaning. Words like family, house, friend have been hollowed out. They seem parodies of older meanings and reflect the hysterical modes of belonging through which my teens' families cling in the face of, a, of this larger disappearance of meaning. A general homogenization holds sway in the suburbs. Everyone, no matter what their origin, seems to become alike. If there are deviations, eccentricities, idiosyncrasies, these are permitted ones. There's a way to be fun, wacky, surprising, and so on in the verbs. There's a way to be diverse, to be homosexual, to be ethically other, to be working class. Hyperbolic positivity abounds in the work of Nietzsche and the verbs. Nietzsche's older sister is a business consultant, specializing in recruiting edgy young people to work in the tech sector. She visits their sixth form, looking for what she thinks of as um, acceptably countercultural types who might make suitably dynamic trainees. Formal education for my teens is, for the most part, mere processing, leading everyone into the suburban office. There are a few maverick teachers left at their comprehensive school a non-traditional economist, a doomy geographer, but my teens largely educate themselves, being fascinated by countercultural role models and musicians, both expected and unexpected. Arthur Rimbaud, uh, Kurt Cobain, Nadia Tolokno from Pussy Riot, the musician and former Orthodox monk, uh, Jason Marler. My teens talk to spare, suicidal ideation and a fascination with death. They're full of misanthropy, a dislike of the drudge-like masses who populate their sixth form and have a sense of superiority for those around them. But they're sensitive too to the plight of the bullied. They're full of bystanders' guilt about incidents they witnessed in, in, in the lower school. They have a love-hate relationship to the fee-paying school children they come across, who seem in possession of the cultural capital they lack. And they have an ambivalent desire for apocalypse for the coming climatic and financial collapse that cannot be controlled and managed. My characters show a general but unfocused yearning for revolution, for the overturning of the world, but they have no meaningful connection to political life, to the public sphere. For them, politics is just centralist technocratic managerialism, busying itself with the solutions business, with control of problems and the negotiation of interests. It's merely an extension of the model of control they see everywhere. My teens show spiritual yearning as well as inchoate philosophical tendencies. They want to know why things are so dreary. They're intellectuals of a kind, but also crave excitement, altered states through drunkenness and drug taking. Sometimes they yearn for peace too, for open time, for interregna of various kinds cycling slowly, lying in the grass, smoking weed, truanting. And they have nascent artistic yearnings which drive them to make music. They want to redeem their lives in some way, to make sense of their time in the suburbs. Enter my character Nietzsche, subdued, shy, ardent. My novel note shows how he intensifies and focuses the discontent of my teens. He talks tersely about nihilism, about the death of God, and expresses suspicion, of pity, of compassion. He thinks their despair is sham, 
and to be driven deeper. Crucially, his very presence makes them want to reform their band and to recruit him as lead singer. The novel builds towards the first gig of the band, Nietzsche and the Birds. Let me turn to the historical Nietzsche. My guiding question here is what is the significance of, of music in Nietzsche's work? The real for Nietzsche is becoming, which is to say constant change without enduring stable entities, without beings. There are processes that can interact and produce temporary forms, but those forms dissolve again. There's no overall purpose or goal to becoming. Nietzsche argues that human life can be sustained only by a greater or lesser denial of this chaos, by establishing horizons within which human beings can live. These horizons are, in a sense, lies. But lies are more valuable than truth when it comes to our flourishing, since the truth that existence is chaotic and meaningless is too much to bear. Philosophy can reveal the truth of the coming, but it cannot establish the horizons that allow human beings to thrive. It cannot transfigure chaos, becoming into a new order. So what can? Only music is capable of this transfiguration, according to Nietzsche. Music can allow the affirmation of existence as a whole in all its chaos and contradictoriness. This is because it's able to work directly on our bodies. Let me explain how. In his later thought, Nietzsche uses the term will to power to refer to the fundamental struggle of becoming with itself. The will to power is a struggle among all things for dominance and self-overcoming. Beings exist insofar as they are moments of the will to power, which is to say in and through their antagonistic relation to other things. Human beings experience this struggle in the struggle of competing feelings, emotions, moods, or passions. These passions in turn reflect deeper drives and impulses that work in and through us. These drives and impulses ordered in instinctual systems are the manifestation of the real, of the will to power. For Nietzsche, we should not understand the human being primarily as a mind or a soul but as a self or body that consists of a multiplicity of passions. Each passion, as a moment of the will to power, strives to overcome other moments, bringing passions into conflict. The danger is that the internal struggle of the passions squanders human energies, unless the body is properly trained and marshaled. How does this training occur? The traditional philosophical answer the answer, say, of Plato or Aristotle, is through rational control. We have to work to consciously order our passions. Nietzsche has a different view. Since for him, human beings are primarily affective rather than thinking beings, the role of rationality itself is relatively superficial when considered with respect to our affective life. Indeed, our passions are, ba are barely open to self-examination at all. We are unable to recognize or understand the way we are shaped by instinctual forces, let alone bring these forces under rational control. So how then can we regulate our passions at all? How can they be ordered? Nietzsche's answer is music. Music can overcome our internal strife by coordinating the passions and establishing a proper hierarchy among them. But how? The movement, the rhythmic movement in music from dissonance to consonance that produces harmony is very suggestive for Nietzsche. He gives a similar role to harmony in the coordination of what he calls the rank ordering of the passions. Music trains and disciplines the human body and not only the individual body. For Nietzsche, musical discipline may produce an appropriately harmonized ethos for a community of people, perhaps a culture. This is how music can be understood to transfigure the chaos of the real, to provide a temporary form in the flux of the coming. Unlike rationality, which seeks to suppress the passions, musical harmony preserves passions, maintaining the internal tension of the body, bringing them under control. The role of musical training is, is particularly important 
in the wake of the cultural decline of Christianity. Formerly, Christianity constrained and ordered human passions by subordinating them to a rational God and a rational cosmos. This internal regulation, a whole system of instincts, begins to fail with the death of God. This might appear to be liberatory, since the old restraints no longer hold. But those restraints gave human beings order, purpose, and direction, even though Christianity is, as Nietzsche argues at length, implicitly life-denying. We can't go back to Christianity, but we can seek a new instinctual system to order our passions. This is the way in which we might become worthy of the death of God, and thereby complete and overcome nihilism. The problem is that it's too hard to confront the void that the death of God leaves. The real, the will to power, is unbearable in the raw. Hence, the rise of movements of thought, such as positivism, materialism, and utilitarianism, that conceal the flux of becoming, preventing the completion of nihilism. But the collapse of the Christian order is felt by some. So-called passive nihilists reject the world, taking refuge in pessimism and resignation. This, for Nietzsche, is the position of Schopenhauer. Active nihilists, on the other hand, seek to destroy the world in the manner of the Russian nihilists in the novels of, of Dostoevsky and elsewhere. In both cases, the real is hard to bear. It needs to be transfigured if it is to be endured at all. But how is this possible? Back to my novel. At the time of their first meeting with, with Nietzsche, the teens of my novel are thirsty for metamorphosis, though they hardly know it. They've experienced the, the death of God, though they're not sure about that either, unlike the sixth formers around them. But they've not yet become worthy of this experience. The ultimate fear of my teens is of transforming into a form of existence the historical Nietzsche called the last man. Last because it interprets itself as the end and purpose of creation. My characters find the smug self-satisfaction of the last man all around them in the sixth form common room where their peers snack and surf on their phones. Their fellow sixth formers lack a future. They lack the desire to challenge and thereby overcome their mode of existence. They're content with a banal hedonism, with a self-satisfied happiness, which is the consolation of those whose passions are no longer ranked or hierarchized, who lack an enlivening in the struggle. For the time being, then unmedicated despair allows my characters to escape from making the suburban adjustment that would see them becoming the last man. For the moment, they have no spiritual investment in the suburbs as they are, in the lifetimes, the lifestyles of their families and schoolmates. They are saved by their desire for revolutionary change, for self-overcoming. They're saved by music. Music is central to my teens. It opens them to intensities and alterities that the suburbs cannot manage into quiescence. Music loves for them, hates for them. Music desires for them. Music yearns for them. They talk music constantly. And even better, there is music making, which provides my characters with a goal, helping them to coordinate their passions reshaping their affective lives. My character's band allows them to become conduits of larger trans-suburban forces. Initially, their music is a muddle. We overhear them trying out a variety of kinds of music, including doom metal, stoner metal, dub. Every form of music open to them seems culturally exhausted it's all been done before. They lack the capacity to believe in themselves as musicians and to believe that culture in some sense is alive. But when Nietzsche joins them as a singer, they feel their way into an open-ended, improvisational musical practice. What does it sound like? Here is a description from my novel. Marimba tone clusters. 
surging jagged melody lines over a shifting bass. The whole band moving slowly in and out of sync. Planes of music, terraced music, a marimba riff, brief solos moving in and out, my guitar, Paula's bass. Now I'm playing the riff, marimba counter melodies, marimba counter rhythms, pushing against Bill's beat, funky comping, Merv's sound phrases, swirls glissanding upwards, semi-pitched electronic sounds from art, rising notes panning across the stereo field, tensions, releases, going on at once. A moving tapestry, a multi-level web, almost too congested, a traffic jam of sound, make room, make room. Simmering down, marimba and guitar playing cat and mouse. How do we imagine this sound? I think of the cosmic music of the German band Can in the period of their 1973 album, Future Days. An expansive, weightless music, full of spatial movement, open to the sky. I'm also reminded of Miles Davis's freeform funk as heard on the 1975 albums, Agata and Pangea, which are all about groove, texture and muscle, about, about the heavy, humid funk of the group as a whole. I think of the music of the gamelan, pulsing and shimmering, moving in and out of several forms of dissonance, several tensions and releases at the same time. It is a music of potential that never completes itself, never resolves itself once and for all. It is, in a sense, all possible music. Now, what does my character Nietzsche add to this mesh of music? He adds a kind of speech singing. Here is my description. Nietzsche's speech song, barely whispered. Nietzsche's speech song, accompanying the music, whispering beside it. Nietzsche's speech song, asking for nothing, demanding nothing, murmuring nothing more. Nietzsche's speech song, how weak it is, how close to nothingness. Nietzsche's speech song, only streams of words, half words, only an indistinct murmuring, like a conversation you can't quite hear. Nietzsche's speech song drifting in and out of silence, making no claims. Nietzsche's speech song almost out of earshot. Nietzsche's speech song adding barely anything and taking nothing away. Nietzsche's speech song like dew on the grass, like light on water. Do not hinder it, do not stand in its way, make space for it. No, heed how it makes space for itself. Heed how it makes time, creates time. Hear how it creates space for us and time. So what do Nietzsche's vocals sound like? I'm reminded of Damo Suzuki's vocal from the band Can, which are like a magical mist, a spray, another element of the shimmering texture of the music. I also think of Jandek's Glasgow Monday, where the representative from Cornwood, the singer of the band, tremulously speech sings questions over piano and percussion. The point is that the vocals are only part of a carpet of sound. They are but an element of the music. So how is the band's music going to overcome nihilism? We find a clue in my narrator Chandra's version of Amo Fati. Amor Fati, the love of fate. For Chandra, the hope is that he and his friends might redeem their suburban lives by performing and recording their music, making sense of everything that has happened to them. Their creativity affirms the conditions of their creativity, the fact that they were born and brought up in the suburbs of Wokingham. For this reason, according to Chandra, the hometown wouldn't just be another knot in the great sprawl of the suburbs of Southeast England, but the origin of this transformative music, indeed its only possible origin, which would make it a place worthy of pilgrimage from their, of their admirers. So what would the pilgrims see? 
a town like any other, just the same as any other, but also a town that was also unlike any other, because it was the condition for the music of Nietzsche and the birds. And maybe these pilgrims could go back to their own suburban towns and make a firmatory, transfiguring music of their own. As such, my character Chandra dreams of a collective Amorphati, a love of their fate that would show their audience a way of loving the suburban hand they'd been dealt. This would free them from the spirit of hatred and revenge of the active nihilist, since they could thereby overcome the resentment of being born and brought up in such an insignificant Philistine place. Music making would allow my teens to lift every ephemeral moment of their lives out of irrelevancy and contingency by establishing its absolute importance to their musical creativity. Everything that's happened to them would now be a necessary condition of their music making and is thereby affirmed by it. The danger is that Chandra's account of, the, of his band's project seems to rest on a model of subjective volition, subjective volition, the historical Nietzsche would reject. Nietzsche challenged the no notion of individual agency, seeing the individual will as a metaphysical fiction. Although we experience ourselves as causal agents able to affect changes in the world, the autonomous self-regulating subject is a myth. On the real Nietzsche's account, the, the real agent of our willing is the will to power in all its indifference and amorality. He often uses the word life to name the organic differentiations of the will to power and writes of the will to life. And I'll follow him in this. I'll, I'll write life or a will to power, a will, life or will to life rather than will to power. The suburbs in their entirety will be only a moment of the will to life, a temporary form that has arisen from the flux of becoming. But life is causally and ontologically primary. It cannot be contained or channeled by any particular form, including that of the suburbs. Life's creativity always involves moments of destruction as it overcomes its current ordering. Now I think we have a better understanding than Chandra's own of the ambitions of his, of his band. Their affirmatory music would allow its members to encompass their formerly negative feelings, their moments of pessimistic resignation, passive nihilism, their fervor to destroy themselves, their will to nothingness, their desire to annihilate the world, active nihilism. It would allow, it would allow them to harmonize their experiences, ordering their passions such that pain becomes part of the general economy of joy. It would lead to a new system of instincts that would allow others to harmonize their experience too. But we need to go further still in understanding what the teens seek with their music. For the historical Nietzsche, the ultimate test of the desire to transfigure the world is paradoxically to will it exactly as it is, to desire for everything that led up to it at this moment, to return over and again. This is the famous notion of eternal recurrence the eternal return. The question that faces my characters is, can you consent to affirm that your suburban life happened over again with its last men, with its cruelties, with your bystander's guilt? To really, to really love your suburban fate means you must be willing to endure it again countless times. My characters approach this test musically. Towards the end of the novel, they declare themselves ready to play the suburbs, to play the suburban eternity, in their words. They're going to play every suburban event as it rings out in eternity. This is how they put it. We're going to play what has happened before, what will happen again. We're going to play the traffic jam, which is every traffic jam. The roadworks that are every roadwork. That's what they say. My characters resolve to play the new housing estates, the new apartment blocks. 
they mean to play their future of suburban, of, of student debt and temporary jobs. So this might seem to be, to be merely figurative. How can you play buildings and roadworks? Are the band playing a kind of program music like Beethoven's pastoral symphony? There's a parallelism, parallelism between music and the larger world, between dissonance and suffering, between consonance and the resolution of suffering, and between the harmony that follows from the harmonizing of dissonance and the harmonizing of the passions. To play the suburbs would mean on this account to sound the suburbs in all their dreariness as one element of musical harmony. It's quotidian nihilism, the devaluation of values to the, ne to the level of banality and nullity is counterbalanced by the encompassing will to life that threatens to shatter the suburban horizon. The band music would contain both the banality of the last man of the sixth form common room and office life, as well as the bullying and cruelty of the lower school, and in harmonic tension with it, the exuberance of life understood in the infinite horizon of its becoming. The narrative builds up to the following at this point. These are the characters speaking in their collective voice. They often speak chorally in, in the novel. We are going to affirm the eternal return of the suburbs. We are going to affirm the eternal return of the suburban void, the suburban tautology. We are going to affirm the eternal return of botched days, of ruined days. We are going to affirm the incessancy of what does not happen. So that's my characters. For the historical Nietzsche, the strength to will the eternal return is available only to the ubermensch, the overhuman, whose hard fatalism lets them relinquish any notion of their individual will in the affirmation of life. By willing the eternal recurrence of all things, by joining the individual will to the will to life, the overhuman slips free of antecedent causality, becoming in this way a self-creator and also the creator of the world. The ubermensch would want not only that everything to have happened as it did, but that it happened in, in, in this way over and over again. The danger is that we understand the transition to the ubermensch, the overhuman, as a merely personal transformation, rather than as a change in historical existence of the human being. In contrast to the last man, the overhuman cannot think of itself as, a, as, as an endpoint, as a final evolutionary stage. The over in overman, the uber in ubermensch, should be understood in terms of overcoming, of a thirst for physiological, cultural, and spiritual metamorphosis. As such, the overhuman is not interested in self-preservation, in what is normally called health or happiness. The overhuman is aligned more, most closely with life, expressing and discharging life's overfulness opening a genuine future. Now, what are the conditions for the appearance of the overman who could will the eternal return? The real Nietzsche sometimes suggests that the ubermensch, the overman, will require generations of training, of breeding to appear. My characters, by contrast, often seem to believe they can become the overhuman at one stroke through a titanic act of affirmation. They project this onto Nietzsche, the character. Their dream is that their performance, led by Nietzsche at their gig, would allow them to create themselves and to create the suburbs like gods, or rather, like the god Dionysus. But this collective affirmation depends on Nietzsche, their leader. The question is, can he keep it together for the gig? Can he hold on to his sanity? He had a mental breakdown before. Chandra's hope for the gig is that the band play music that says, I want the world as it is, exactly as it is. That would change everything that ha ever happened to them into an I wanted it thus. Chandra hopes that the band will be able to receive the suburbs as they are and over and over. What actually happens? Noise, Chandra writes. 
chaos, the unlimited, the unordered, the uncomposed, the anti-song, the non-song. Chandra writes of unearthly screaming, a kind of quavering and buzzing, which emerges from Nietzsche's throat. Nietzsche collapses mid-gig. An ambulance is, is called. Nietzsche is carried away by, by paramedics. Later, we learn that he's, been, he's now in the locked ward of a mental hospital. A disaster then, a failure of a gig and a failure of the band to affirm the suburbs as they are. But is it a failure? Is it a disaster? In his generous reading of my novel, Rudiger Gurner, our host today, very movingly suggests that my Nietzsche is lost in rapture rather than chaos. That Nietzsche, my Nietzsche, hears a, an uber music, an over music in his rapture, a music intended only for the hearing of the ubermensch, a music beyond music, beyond dissonance and consonance, a music perhaps beyond madness. This is very moving. I would say to this, perhaps it could be. Our knowledge as readers of this novel, our knowledge as readers is limited because we only know what Chandra experiences. Maybe Chandra can't understand what my Nietzsche has become. But there's another place where we might discover the affirmation that my characters seek. And this is in the book, Nietzsche and the Burbs itself, which pretends to be an autobiographical work by its narrator, Chandra. Might we see it as accomplishing precisely the act of amor fati, the love of fate, that Chandra seeks for the band. But a book is not music. Now, as we've seen for, for the historical Nietzsche, it is only music that can rank order our passions and harmonize our experiences with a will to life. However, there is something musical about Chandra's book. In its rhythmic flow, its clipped sentence fragments, its meter accentuating italics, its use of ellipses and breaks between sections, and above all, in its use of repetition for the level of paragraph, sentence, phrase, and syllable, Nietzsche and the Burbs might be understood as Chandra's musical affirmation. Chandra as Dionysus, as the creator of himself and the creator of the suburbs, who would affirm the condition of his creativity. Chandra as the real protagonist of my novel, as its secret center, who writes for transfiguration. Is this possible? Chandra as overman, who would will the eternal return of the suburbs, who would redouble the will to life with his own will. Is this what his writing each from the burbs permits him? Or is his book merely a testament to delusion, a way for Chandra to laugh at his own pretension and at the ludicrous ambition of his friends, an acknowledgement that no cultural renewal can reach the suburbs and that life, capital L, is always elsewhere. I'll close with Chandra describing a band rehearsal. Music as open as the sky, like the sea beneath the sky. Music exchanging particles with the air. Music breathing, music mirroring the sky, indistinguishable from the sky. This is what it means to make. This is what it means to order. We're continuing the creation. We're furthering the creation. A controlled explosion. Energy cascading. Energy shaped. Currents and countercurrents. Slipstreams and rapids. Metamorphosis. Our thresholds remade. Our limits redrawn. Song running into song, no break. We've rehearsed this. We know the cues, a marimba vamp, up the tempo, a series of hand claps, slow it down again. A single mass of song, a single continent of song, a Pangaea of song, a Gondowana land, a great molten block, the dentist, deepest, densest groove, a supersaurus in song. This is our music. This is where we are. We've been to the worst and back. We've got lost and we're coming home. This is our music and this is our madness. We've led it home, all the way home. We're in touch with the forces. We ride the forces. This is our music. 
This is our madness. This is how we escape the birds. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lars Ayer. I think uh, you can hear, as it were, the applause, um, because I'm sure it would be very real uh, when we're in the lecture theatre. Thank you so much for such an animating reading of uh, your own text, of your own book, of your novel. And um, I think it, you have also demonstrated um, just how how lively and how special it is um, when an author interprets himself. Uh, this is uh, rare enough to have it in this uh, very particular form um, of display. Thank you indeed. Now, one of your critics, perhaps by way of introducing our Q&A, um, one of your critics uh, titled his review, The Will to Posture. The Will to Posture. Now, this is um, obviously a slight provocation of an otherwise very favorable review, but um, is there any truth in this, do you think? I mean, you spoke a lot about the will to life rather than the will to power, fair enough. Um, you spoke a lot about, shall we say, also the significance of the transhuman, the overhuman, the übermensch, um, perhaps uh, also to be able to step outside of what it means to be human in order to know what you need to transcend. Um, but can we believe all this? I'm not talking about a historical Nietzsche, of course, I'm talking about your characters. And um, is there a truth in what this reviewer pointed out simply by choosing this title, if it was this title, um, you never know in these days, but um, is there something in here which tells us, well, after all, there's also a lot of humor in this in this book, a lot of humor, mm. but it's serious humor in so many ways. Um, Ernst de Scherzer, as Goethe would have said. Um, I think it's probably an interesting an interesting take that uh, this reviewer suggested. Is is there a lot of camouflage in this? Is there a lot of pretending? Is there a lot of trying to be ever so musical? Or um, how credible did you want your characters to be? I want my characters to be totally credible. <laughs> so it's interesting, the reviews often say, this band, uh, this another team band, they're, they're probably a load of rubbish. You know, they, they have these crazy ambitions for their band. These, these are obviously nonsense. No, for me, I take the, the musical project extremely seriously. It's a tribute to, People I knew when I was growing up in the suburbs, uh, people I knew growing up whose musical taste was unbelievably sophisticated and nuanced. People who came from backgrounds with no books, no culture around at all, but who had the, this incredible finesse in their taste and unbelievable musical knowledge. I also pay tribute in this novel to people who also in the suburbs had great musical skill. And there are many people who are simply fantastic at playing instruments or uh, singing. Um, there's such incredible talent out there. And it always strikes me in these moments of musical ferment, such as, for example, think of things like punk um, in the 70s. In these moments of ferment, such as New Wave that follows on punk, you find people who never thought of themselves as musicians, as singers, stepping up, stepping up to the mic, buying a guitar, becoming musicians themselves. We can think here of, of, of the band Joy Division. These people were they left school, they, they, they were doing you know, boring jobs, they were clerks and things like this, they had no musical ambition until punk arrived, the Sex Pistols played Manchester, and suddenly these people began to make music. And it's these kinds of people I want to pay tribute to. Teens, people in their early 20s, who show this incredible musical ability, musical sensitivity, and produce music as if from nowhere. So in my novel, in, in the way I wrote my novel, I'm 100% um, sincere in my presentation of these teens. I admire my teens. I, I root for my teens. There's another question. And this is the question which I, I was thinking about today as I, as I walked into the university to print out my paper just now. I asked myself this, I'm writing about um, this relationship to, to, to Nietzsche. This is a, the Anglo-German relations of, of, of the um, lecture series which I'm contributing. Anglo-German relations. 
And I picked these figures. I picked Wittgenstein, I picked Nietzsche and, and, and Simone Weil for the next novel. Out of a sense of enormous sadness, as well as a sense of possibility and excitement. Because these characters, these, these philosophers are so far from suburban reality as I've experienced it in the UK. People in the suburbs are not interested in philosophy um, it, it, as it's linked to these proper names. They regard this stuff as pretentious and foolish. And it's in these terms that I might read this, this idea of, of a will to posture. But it's a characteristic attitude that we find in the suburbs, that we find perhaps in the UK in general, towards any sincere intellectual ambition. That the temptation is always to say, oh, come off it. The temptation is always to say, how pretentious. The, the temptation is to say, that's a lot of European nonsense. And those of us who've worked in European philosophy have had to endure a great deal of this from our colleagues in other parts of philosophy in the UK. So, the, the, the phrase will to posture gets my heckles up. I'm, I'm hostile to this. I'm 100% sincere in this novel. I root for my, my characters. I'm sad that we live in a world that would have to think of teen ardency as something posturing or pretentious. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the provocation works with the first question. I'm pleased about that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, whoever would like to come in now, um, please use the raise hand function and then unmute yourself. Um, whilst you're still thinking about this, uh, let me also say that um, I mentioned to, to Lars before that uh, we have here the Oscar Levy Forum for Nietzsche Studies at QMUL. So in many ways, your lecture this evening bridges something here between two uh, fora, as it were, and um, you said it, the Anglo-German dimension here, of course, is um, perfectly covered, given that you, as um, a English academic, as an English writer, uh, write about, you're not about Nietzsche, but uh, you write uh, about a transformation of Nietzsche, and you pick out this um, very extraordinary phenomenon of the suburb, suburbia and philosophy. I think this is a, a very exciting, a very exciting way of approaching it. So um, I have to admit that um, I was very taken with this novel um, simply because of the skill and also the passion you unfold through these characters. Um, and the way you depict um, voices. I mean, this book is, uh, in my view at least, uh, composed in many ways. This is a real composition, a prose composition. But enough of that. So please, um, who is first? Talking committed. Alexander, I think, is the first. Alexander Hello. Um, hi. Um, thank you very much for the the, the talk that was fascinating. Um, I just had a lecture on Nietzsche and we're looking at Nietzsche's idea of history as part of our German idea of history module. Um, I was interested more in the, you talked about music as a process of self overcoming um, and actualization. Um, do you feel like there, is that something that can be like applied outwards from the novel, like if, is that an encouragement for other people to pursue creative outlets as a form of self-overcoming or? Um... Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. Um, you know, I've become very interested in this idea of uh, Amor Fati, the love of fate. And it's something I've, I've been drawn to in, in my teaching in creative writing. And the, the thing which interests me here is producing something, writing something about yourself, about anything really, seems to involve an implicit, I have to be very sensitive here, some kind of implicit affirmation, some way in which this event, these things that happened to you can be enclosed in a, in a particular form. Um, so there's something about the, a work of any kind, any kind of creative work, which takes up what's happened to you, which expresses it, which, which makes it into something. And this for me um, is what, you know, you, you mentioned use that phrase, um, self-overcoming, and this phrase actualization. This is what these, 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 these words, these phrases might name, that through Amor Fati, you, you somehow 
and I, I, again, I have to be very precise here, I shouldn't be too vague, you leave something behind, you, you depart from something, you put something aside, even if it continues to haunt you in some way, nevertheless, a reckoning has been made, and the work itself, that which you've completed, um, allows you in some sense to move on. So that's how I'd understand this idea of self-overcoming when it comes to creativity. But I wonder whether the creativity could be understood more broadly to include not just uh, writing of a particular kind or even music making, whether we could think of, 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 a, of a, an art of life, an art of life that would include things like uh, um, cooking, um, repairing um, curtains, making, making quilts, and these, these, these sorts of activities, which also express um, your relationship to yourself, your, your, your culture, your, your past. Um, think of the way in which a quilt can assemble scraps of, um, scraps of material that have played a role in, your, in, in upbringing your children, perhaps. So creativity may be always involve this kind of, of reckoning, of working through, working with things that have happened to you. And perhaps, and perhaps in that sense, always point to what is self-overcoming, that it can open a future for you. Just now I spoke about the last man, the, the human being of the suburbs, this, this type of individual who is always satisfied, who's always pleased with themselves, who takes refuge in a banal hedonism, in just gratifying immediate um, impulses. But by contrast, any kind of creativity involves some measure of craft, of discipline, of ordering and shaping, of the, the rank ordering of passions in, in Nietzsche's sense. And this rank ordering, this, this self-transformation, I think is part of this process of self-overcoming, of opening a future for yourself. So in that sense, Alexander, um, to respond to your question more directly, yes, I would want to broaden out this notion of self-overcoming or actualization from, from music um, specifically, or from writing and fiction. Thank you. The next question is Josh Torabi, in fact, the chair of our uh, Oscar Levy Forum. Josh, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Lars, for your talk. Um, if this event was happening in person, I'd ask you to sign my copy of Nietzsche and the Burbs, <laughs> but, uh, hopefully another time. And as someone who grew up in a suburb of Birmingham and was an aspiring guitarist, I was certainly rooting for your characters. Uh, indeed, I grew up with people like them, uh, not so much the Nietzsche character, but certainly the others. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you uh, principally about method and whether you could say a little bit more about how you went about constructing musicality in your narrative. And I wonder if you saw yourself describing or writing music or a bit of both. And, you know, your novel does add a complex layer to this as you're writing about fictional musicians and music. And when you, when you read those passages aloud, I was reminded actually of Thomas Mann's depiction of his fictional composer Leverkusen's music in Dr. Faustus. But I often think this issue of musicality in prose fiction takes us back to the birth of tragedy and this tension that might or might not exist in depicting a Dionysian art such as music in an Apollonian form such as the novel. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is a great question. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, the question is how, how do you make your prose dance? How do you make it sprung like a dance floor? Um, how you can give it a rhythm that allows it to continue um, music itself in, in some way. You mentioned the birth of tragedy. In that period, Nietzsche, of course, is writing all these essays, wonderful essays, and he focuses in particular on rhythm. And one of the things he writes about is um, Dionysian rhythm. If I, if I can remember correctly, he writes about the way in which such rhythm involves accent, using accents to transform basic, a basic pulse in something which, which becomes danceable. And this really was, was important to me because I wanted to think about how I can make my prose um, rhythmical in this sense. As I understand it, the word rhythm meant something quite different before Plato and Aristotle to after Plato and Aristotle. If I read Emile Bonveniste on, on the notion of rhythm, he tells us that etymologically it comes from this sense of flow and that Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, had this sense of flow when he, when he wrote about rhythm. And this was lost in, in Aristotle and Plato, who make it much more about a regular pulse. And the argument that, um, that I suppose one could make here is that this notion of rhythm as flow is reborn in the 19th century, in Nietzsche, Baudelaire, and, and Mallarmé, in um, various, various figures. So this idea of some kind of flow. 
So my question in writing this novel was, how can I make my, my fiction flow in a similar way? How can I bring it to life? Now, I tend to use these quite short sentences, these, these sentence fragments. I tend to make them quite clipped and uh, I break up longer sentences. So that might seem to prevent me from using, from accessing this flow. But what I thought to myself was, okay, I want to have a, a flow that works through these clip sentence fragments, a flow that took as, as its unit something larger, so perhaps a paragraph or several paragraphs or sections. So the idea is then to have as, as, as the rhythmic flow, something which flows through a paragraph. And that was in my own way, trying to continue that fluid flowing rhythm that I, I found in Nietzsche's work. So that's the idea of answering Nietzsche's own text with my own work. So you asked me this interesting question here, whether I'm describing or writing music in my work. Now, ostensibly I'm describing music and writing these passages about music took me absolutely ages. The whole novel took years and years and years of work. It's really very hard to construct these things. I was very pleased to hear Rudiger call it composed. It was intended to be composed. It took a long, long time to do so. And the way which I um, had to work with music was to read an awful lot of music books. I mean, many, 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 dozens and dozens of books on music in which music is described to try and learn a way in which I could convey what's happening musically. On the one hand, yes, I wanted to, to, to awaken this sense of rhythmic flow. But I also wanted to use appropriate items of vocabulary, appropriate um, uh, words that would resonate with people who were themselves musicians, or even people who weren't musicians. I have no ability whatsoever as a musician. I, I can't play anything, I can't sing or anything, anything like this at all. I've always been in awe of musicians. When I was young, I used to go to Denmark often. I had to sit in on rehearsals of the symphony orchestra that played in Tivoli. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm a friend of my uncle's um, was a percussionist and he would allow me to sit in. I, I'd sit there and listen for, you know, many times for hours and hours just because I, I enjoyed being in the presence of, of, of music making. So I've also had that great love of music. And this novel was my, was my attempt to attest to that love and to be able to find a, a way of writing that music, which wasn't mere description, which was itself musical, which continued this music. So that was the idea. And that's um, how I approached it, by reading a lot of books about music and thinking about style, the multifarious art of style, thinking about how I can answer to Nietzsche's style and continue it in my own work. Just one brief observation, if I may. It's also interesting that uh, the very structure of your novel is um, time oriented. I mean, we're talking about uh, 11, uh, sorry, 10 weeks in um, the life of this band, of these protagonists. And uh, it's interesting that towards the end, the bits become shorter and shorter and shorter. There's a kind of dynamics that unfolds uh, throughout, which I think is interesting. So uh, just to um, underpin the moment of rhythm in this context. Great. Um, I'm echoing what Josh uh, said. I could also relate to, to it. I'm not from the suburb so much, but the other side of the Thames Valley. And oh. was also <laughs> so I, thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought it was, it was, you could just, you could see these characters and they were just so, so vivid. Um, I want to ask a sort of slightly, um, just in terms of how, what you decided to keep from sort of, you know, biographical information and um, how, so I, think, I think personally it was really well done, how you incorporated elements, but they weren't so obvious. I mean, I kicked myself at Paul Paula at the end, because <laughs> um, I hadn't clocked onto that. Um, yeah. <laughs> what how the decision was to what to include um, and what not to include and how to sort of uh, get that balance right. Yeah, thank you for this, um, um, this, this uh, phrase from a fellow Thames Valley person. The Thames Valley is a very unliterary area. It's, um, the suburbs there, they seem to defy any kind of literary uh, interpretation or literary work. And for me, you know, part of writing on the suburbs and a Nietzsche at the same time was um, a sadness about this. These, these, these are places where, which, which are culturally bereft, where they lack a cultural dimension. And young people growing up in these areas are deprived of that. And this is, this is for me, um, tragic. As you say, the characters are, um, they, 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 they reflect um, ordinary suburban experience. I wanted, I don't know if people have noticed this yet, but all the characters' names are taken from 
teen soap operas and teen dramas of various kinds. Kids from Fame, uh, Hollyoaks, or you know, all, all, they're all taken from these various dramas, Neighbours, and even the locations are taken from soap operas and, uh, and uh, teen films uh, of all descriptions. So what I wanted to produce here was an every suburb it would resonate from any, with anyone who lived in a, in a reasonably middle class, you know, reasonably wealthy suburb, wherever they are in the world. And the, 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 the experiences of the characters are supposed to be exactly those you find explored in, um, I don't know, what's the sort of thing, My So-Called Life, if you remember that um, uh, teen drama from 20 years ago or so, with Claire Danes, parents getting divorced, people coming to terms with sexuality, these sorts of typical teenager dramas. And that's what allows the novel to be readable by hopefully anybody. You know, the idea is that he's something which can have genuine appeal. You can do all this lofty Nietzschean stuff. On the other hand, for me, the art of the novel now in these times, this is something which reflects probably my, um, my own suburbanism, you know, my own suburban background. The art of the novel, you've got to communicate with, uh, with people in this world, uh, people around us who are not brought up in any literary culture. Um, Rudiger mentioned a, a manifesto of mine, which I wrote several years ago, as kind of a jape, as a kind of bit of fun. But the heart of it was something quite serious. In that manifesto, I lamented the disappearance of, of literary culture. This is something which is, which is going. So my great pain as a writer is to try and connect literary culture to forms which are forms like soap opera or American teen films, which might be a way in for readers who wouldn't normally be drawn to a book with Nietzsche in the title. So that's the idea, to join together um, these, these forms of, 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 you know, of TV and, and film, to join these with something more philosophical, to join these things together. And perhaps, you know, in joining them, um, there's, a, there's a discord, there's a disharmony, there's a dissonance. My hope is there's a constance of some kind. My hope is that they, they work together in some way. So that's, that's the issue. You, you talk about how I, um, you asked me how I decided to include or exclude certain things. I wanted to have all of the familiar people from Nietzsche's biography in the, um, in the novel. I have his sister. So if you know Nietzsche's biography, you, you know his sister was a, a dreadful person, an anti-Semite, a racist who, who um, linked Nietzsche's work to Mussolini and, and later allowed him to be taken up by fascists, a dreadful human being. So I have a version of her, and she's a recruitment consultant in the Thames Valley, working for these big firms, trying to bring in these six formers into these, um, into these big firms, these big corporations. And the way she does it um, is to try to seize upon teens' counter-cultural counter kudos. They're cool. It's to draw in teens through what makes them dynamic and exciting, and to suck that dynamism and life out of them. In the novel, you find Nietzsche's mother, a version of Nietzsche's mother. You find Paul Ray, a version of Paul Ray. It's pretty remote from actual Paul Ray. There's a Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer's in there, he's art. Art was Schopenhauer. Um, these things mutated as I wrote. And who else is in there? All kinds of people are in there, all kinds of references to all kinds of things. It's full of allusions, and musically, it's full of musical allusions as well. So the idea was to try and include everything, to join everything together in such a way that it would appeal to a contemporary audience my, my, my fancy of a young audience, and they would also resonate with people who are very familiar with Nietzsche's work and, and Nietzsche's thought. Thank you very much. We have Melanie as the next, uh, the next question, please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. I've got my microphone working. Um, thank you for your... Um, for your talk on the book, it was really, really fascinating. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, one of them was that I thought it was really interesting um, that you said that Chandra, the narrator, um, at the end you said he could possibly be using this sort of narrative to um, reflect on or laugh at his own ambitions or the ambitions mm. of his, um, and the way in which they sort of um, project this desire for almost salvation from the suburbs onto, onto Nietzsche. So I wondered whether or not there was, even though these, um, even though they are sort of to be taken seriously, whether or not there is also some sort of ambivalence or degree of irony um, in the way that they sort of take Nietzsche as their leader um, and the way in which they sort of um, fully throw themselves into the music as this kind of um, redeeming force, I guess. 
And the other question I had, which perhaps ties into that, um, was that I also thought it was really interesting how you described um, the character Nietzsche's breakdown and the song that he was singing as, as a non-song and whether that kind of, I mean, what you're thinking behind that was and um, whether that kind of ties into the ambivalence perhaps of what the music maybe represents to. Mm, thank you, this, this is both very interesting questions. Yeah, um, exactly today, I, I, I left my final paragraph for the day to write. I, I didn't want to write, finish off my paper right at the last moment because I thought that that's often when you are um, you're most productive right right up to a deadline and that's why that paragraph came back Chandra that maybe he's reflecting on his own his own um, to go back to that uh, word used earlier his own posturing you know his own pretentiousness maybe the sense in which he has a, you know, there's a, there's a way in which he has a sense of that because he's suburban I think of my own my own being a suburban person is that I, I have an instinct very very deeply um, part of me to say, think of everything as being pretentious or portentous or posturing. So I really have that, a very, very strong sense of that in me. Um, it's always there. And my suburban characters, I think, have that too. It seemed towards the end of the novel where they're walking through Reading, Reading's um, suburban town where they're going to play their gig. And they say to themselves, you know, the, the band are talking, well, tonight is our great gig. We're gonna transform the suburbs. We're gonna, ch we're gonna alter them culturally. We're gonna accomplish this great revolution. And they're doing it ironically. They're doing it ironically because they know that this whole thing is, and that the whole world of Nietzsche, of Nietzsche the character, and Nietzsche the philosopher, this whole world of music that they're, that they're trying to conjure up, you know, it, it, it is as nothing. It is of no consequence whatsoever in the suburban world in which they live. The point here is that, that they, they know they're not gonna transform culture. They know that no one is gonna be there at the gig who has a great interest in transforming their lives. So they know the futility of what it is they're doing. As I was writing the paper today um, for, to read out for, the, for today, I thought I hadn't really registered that strongly enough in the paper itself. And it occurred to me that just this afternoon, yes, Chandra may well be aware that all this could, is occurring as it were in quotation marks. He's on the one hand, he's sincere. On the other hand, he's not sincere. He's not fully sincere. And as I walked into university to print out this paper, I, I had another thought. I thought I could add another paragraph here. And that would be about me as the writer of this novel. I wrote this novel, which reflects my own um, teenage years. I wrote this novel. And in that sense, it's, it's doing something similar to Amor Fati, Love of Fate. The novel itself is a love of fate. It's a kind of eternal recurrence. But what I'm doing is willing myself back into the suburbs again. As I wrote the novel, I was, you know, I thought about the suburbs all the time. I, I was right back there in the suburbs. All I could think about was the suburbs. And, I thought, well, in me too, there's, there's, this, there's this division between ardency, intensity, the love of that which shatters the suburban horizons, but also a love of the suburban horizons, a love of this little England, a love of ordinary conventional last man um, view of the world. That, that is very much in me, it's part of me. So I thought about all these things. I thought another thought, um, and that was the paper I've been giving, what I've been writing is too assured, it's too lyrical. It doesn't falter enough. It doesn't fall apart enough. I haven't presented Nietzsche and the Burbs in the right way. There's a fragility here. Which brings me on to the second question you asked me. This is about Nietzsche's breakdown. What does Chandra want? What does Chandra the narrator want of Nietzsche? What are the, why, do they, why do the band take him as their leader? Because of his ardency because of his intensity. Because for Nietzsche, the point is to try and find a form, to compose a form, a dancing star in which chaos can be not merely contained or channeled as it is in the suburbs, where chaos can actually become something, become something living, a dancing star. So that is what Nietzsche is to them, this dancing star. The characters are fascinated by song. And in song, what we find is that chaos finds a form. A, a song um, can give chaos a particular structure. It can compose chaos and hold it together. The terrible danger of my character's music, and they realize this, the terrible danger for their lead singer, for Nietzsche, is that the music is too chaotic. The song is too open-ended. And this is what frightens Chandra. 
He's always worried that Nietzsche will go mad because of the music he's playing, because it's too open-ended, because it does not resolve itself into a, a particular limits. The song is too open, it's too open-ended, it's too improvisational, it goes everywhere, it, you know, it fans out all over the place, it's too much. Chandra worries about Nietzsche all the time. He knows that Nietzsche cannot contain this degree of openness, because this openness is also an openness to chaos. What is madness in the novel? Madness, says Chandra, is chaos of the brain. It's where chaos overwhelms the brain and you can no longer form chaos. What happens to Nietzsche at the end of the novel? I loved Rudiger's um, interpretation of what happened to Nietzsche. The way in which Chandra sees what happened to Nietzsche is different. Chandra sees Nietzsche as being unable to contain music in the form of a song. Music loses its form, it becomes sheer chaos. All through the novel, and through the band practices, Nietzsche is presented as a speech singer, as someone tentative, as someone on the edges of singing. At the end of the novel, what Chandra wants above all, what the whole band wants above all, is for Nietzsche to sing. To sing is to open yourself in some way, is to accept into yourself these forces that the band, Nietzsche and the birds, play with. But when Nietzsche starts to sing, when he tries to sing, that's when he breaks down. That is because, on Chandra's account, that is because he's opened himself up to something too chaotic. He's opened too wide. And that, that, that means that there is no longer a song. There is instead, as you quote, non-song. So that is what um, Chandra takes from Nietzsche. But Rudiger takes something different. And this is what I, I loved in, in, in Rudiger's paper, where he gives a reading of uh, Nietzsche and the Burbs. Um, in that, you point to a possibility that perhaps what Nietzsche has, has, has found is something he hears. He hears something, he's called by something. He feels a vocation. And this vocation takes him beyond madness. And that somehow, although Nietzsche appears to be mad in a mental hospital, nevertheless, he hears this kind of music which is beyond madness. I thought that was a very moving idea. Could one argue, uh, to conclude, our evening. Could one also argue that to a certain extent um, your Nietzsche, the protagonist of your, of your novel, uh, also turns mad because of an over-identification with the real Nietzsche, mm. which in a sense, I mean, there are some biographers of uh, the so-called real Nietzsche uh, who would argue that he suffered from too much of self-identification. And at the same time, the very Nietzsche of uh, history, he had one also a uh, very significant uh, motto for himself, the pathos of distance. That is precisely what he couldn't enact. And um, the pathos of distance in contradiction to the high degree of self-identification. Now, it seems to me that um, this is the one element of the authentic Nietzsche in a historical sense of the word that you have not taken on board or, your, or rather your narrator has not taken on board the pathos of distance. One does never get the sense that there is, uh, shall we say, a stepping back from all of this. It is full involvement, which is mm. fair enough from a narrator's point of view. But it's interesting when one reads through this uh, novel um, that's an element that is completely and utterly absent mm, in my that's, intention. Mm, that's oh. fascinating. Fascinating. Well, it's something I, I, haven't, I, haven't thought about, I haven't thought about it really. In the previous novel, Wittgenstein Jr., I, I did, when I was writing it, I was thinking, okay, here is someone who's plagiarizing a life. He's mm. borrowing a life from a, a historical model. It didn't really, I didn't do much with it um, because it, I think I was worried about the kind of distance that would involve. You know, I worried that if you have this sense of my character Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein Jr., if his character was someone who knew about the life of the real Wittgenstein and, and thought about it, he would become too self-conscious. There, there wouldn't be there, 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 a distance here, which my character Wittgenstein is always trying to close. In that novel, my character Wittgenstein is always trying to become no longer self-conscious. It's, it's this romantic trope, you know, the, the, old, the old story. He's trying to um, return to a simple state of... Um, of awareness, you know, which is not self-conscious, which isn't doubled up and, and, and reflexive. And I think I, I never really thought about whether I should have this distance with my character Nietzsche. And it's a very interesting idea. Perhaps I should do it in my next novel. 
In fact, I do do it in my next novel. Um, the Simone Weil novel, which I'm writing at the moment, is much more about consciously crafting yourself into um, in, in the imitation of a historical model. So that's something that I must do more of in the next novel. The next novel, Simone Weil, it concerns a, um, a transsexual um, woman, um, someone who's, who's, who, who wanted to become Simone Weil. And this, this, this for me is a, a very interesting way to explore this idea of, of distance, of, um, of trying to become something from history that you're not. So this, this is something I, I will go on to explore. And thanks for that very, very interesting comment. The other thing I want to take up just before we finish is this idea of the, um, the form of the novel you mentioned earlier. The idea that the whole novel um, has a kind of structure which is indicated in terms of by, through the, um, the length of scenes. As you move towards the end of the novel, the scenes become shorter and shorter, as though you're moving towards a waterfall and a final collapse. I was thinking about Nietzsche's later work and how often it's structured in the form of, of a sonata and how Nietzsche takes up these, these um, theses and, and works with them as um, dissonances and, and, re and resolves them in various ways and uses these devices like, like symmetry, all kinds of amazing things he does musically. I was wondering how to, how to work and how, what sort of musical form I could think of as a whole that would structure my novel across these 10 weeks. And you know, all I could think of were things like Cannes music, um, perhaps um, some things in, in, in Stockhausen, I'm not sure. But these, these large, large forms, which have no simple internal structure, are gonna indicate that they're coming towards an end by some kind of acceleration or, or some, 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 something which is internal to them. So I thank you for that comment as well, because that made that more present in my, in my mind. Right, I think this brings our evening to a close. Uh, it was fascinating to uh, hear you. It was fascinating to have your responses to so varied questions. Uh, thank you all very much for attending uh, our first BASF lecture this academic year. There will be the next one on the 9th of February with Philip Oltermann, uh, the Guardian correspondent in Germany, who will talk about his experiences of uh, being a Anglo-German correspondent. But uh, once again, Lars Eyer, thank you ever so much for this fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks very much for the questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye for now.